he has spoken on the topics faith, family and freedom in Cuba, Belgium, Brazil, Congo, UK and all over the USA to crowds from 14 to 40,000. International Leadership Speaker, Trainer and Coach Author of Learn to Raw Leadership, Attitude Hack, Live a More Excellent Life, 5 Battle Strategies of a Victorious Warrior. 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award Recipient. Founding Partner of the John Maxwell Team. Toastmaster International Speech Competition Semi-Finalist. Founder of Tell It Like It Is TV, ThatGuyRocks.com and ThatGuySpeaks.com. Creator of Story Power TV, Transforming Grace TV, and Leading Leaders Podcast. Producer of four TV programs and podcasts for Liftable TV and World Trumpet Television as well as multiple social media channels. Please help me welcome J. Lauren Norris. He said to me, come up here, come up here, let me tell you a story. I had, I had just been hit in the face with a baseball and I was crying and it was a really rough day. And when I went up into the stands, this old fella grabbed a hold of my wrist and looked me right in the eye and started telling me a story. And I said, I think I've already heard this one. And then he said, you haven't heard this one because I've never told anybody. And then I said, well, I've already heard the punchline. I was seven. I had no idea what his story was about. I'd never met the man before. I didn't know who he was or why he felt like he needed to tell me a story. But I had all the wise answers in the world and why I shouldn't listen to his story. I'm sure that's never happened to you. But the power of stories for recall is the power of influence for leaders. And that's what I want to talk about in this episode of Leading Leaders. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. Subscribe now. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast, and it really is amazing to me how influencers got their label. And when I say influencers, I mean, uh, well, I, I heard someone say today that they're having a hard time, quote, proving they're a journalist, unquote. And I thought that's an interesting statement because it used to be that if you carried a camera around and you shot footage and you sold it to a news agency, whether it was a local newspaper or it was a, a national news organization like a CNN or a Fox News or ABC or the AP Wire, that you were considered a journalist. You were, you were as credentialed as it gets. And sometimes if you went maybe to the White House or to a large event where there was a lot of security, you had to have that media pass, that backstage all-access kind of press pass. But if you had a press pass, you could pretty much go anywhere you wanted to, shoot whatever you wanted to. Your footage was yours. It belonged to you. That's called freedom of the press. It's uh, actually a First Amendment right, not just freedom of speech, which every American has, but freedom of the press, which means they can say what they believe to be true through their perceptions based on good reporting. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But this individual said they're having a really hard time proving that they are press, that they are journalists. And they made a very profound point at the end of this quasi-argument. The point was this. When they publish their findings, their stories, their news articles, their journalistic research endeavors, for the world to see, they put them on various social media platforms. Maybe it's Substack, maybe it's Rumble, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's TikTok, maybe it's Instagram. And this particular individual said, when I first started this, when I first launched it, I had 40,000 views on the content that I was publishing. Now there are pieces that I put out there that have literally millions of views. Now, I, I want you to back up for just a minute and think... It hasn't always been that we've had the Kardashians and Joe Rogan with 20 and 30 and 40 million 
subscribers who catch every piece of content that they put out. That's what we've come to know as, quote unquote, an influencer. But I want you to back up a minute to the days of the old dude in the bleachers at the baseball stadium. See, the old dude in the bleachers at the baseball stadium wasn't there to coach me that day, but he had previously been my coach when I first started playing baseball in Enid, Oklahoma. And it just turned out that <clears throat> this old dude who was trying to give me advice, well, he, he played some baseball in his life. In fact, if you believe the story of the moon landing, he was one of those guys on the moon that day. I'm just saying he might have known something I didn't know. I hadn't already heard the punchline. I hadn't already heard the story. But see, back in that day, Enid, Oklahoma wasn't the booming metropolis it is today. In fact, if everybody in that town read this journalist's first report 10 times, it might have reached the same exposure that it has on Facebook today. Are you following me? See, there are, there are local newspapers, regional newspapers. The Dallas Morning News doesn't have as many subscribers, not in their printed platform, not in their digital platform, not in their television platform. All of them combined doesn't have as many followers as Joe Rogan. So which one's the real journalist? Is it strictly based on the number of people who are paying attention to what you do? If leaders are influencers and influencers are leaders because John Maxwell is right, leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. So is influence measured by the number of people who have subscribed or paid attention to or visited or watched or read your Substack or your video? Is, is that how you measure influence? Is that what makes you a greater leader? If that's the case, then dare I say, Presidential candidates today who have less views than, I don't know, a rapper are less significant. What if that was true? What if a rapper who could put out a video, I don't know, Tom McDonald, Savage? Well, if they could put out those videos and in a matter of hours have hundreds of thousands or millions of views and... Everybody who watches those videos are influenced. Then that would make Kanye, Savage, Cardi B, world leaders. Wouldn't it? I mean, because that's influence. That makes them greater leaders. <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of peace of mind. <clears throat> Goodness. Uh, let me give you a little bit of peace of mind for those of you who are leaders in various capacities who have influence, maybe in a smaller realm, maybe not 20 million or 40,000, 10,000, but 12, 12 people. Maybe there's 12 people on your team. Maybe there's two teams of six that you oversee. And so you influence 12 people on a regular basis. If you're a leader at that level and you want to have lasting influence, a legacy of leadership, you don't have to have 20 million followers. You don't have to be so big on social media that the world looks at you and says, oh, it doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to be a world leader in a political office, a king of a, a nation or a president. You don't have to do that. But I'll tell you what you do have to do. You have to have stories that resonate deeply, that relate to the people that you lead. You have to tell stories that they recall, they remember. And most importantly, they retell. If you tell great stories, stories that resonate with the heart of people, that draw them to be better people, that inspire them to do something differently, that call out their greatness and drive them toward transformation. If you tell stories like that and people take action on them, then you are an influencer who actually brings about change. Not just somebody who has a lot of people paying attention, but somebody who actually brings about transformation and change in somebody's life. And, and that lasts a long time. It also, in the truest sense of the word, will go viral. See, it's not just the, the video that has the most people looking at the cats jumping away from cucumbers. Uh, that can be a viral sensation. 
Uh, the woman with the uh, Chewbacca mask. That was a viral sensation. I have to ask the honest question, though. If, if you get that many views, if somebody's paying that much attention to you, what good have you done? Have you brought about transformation or just gotten a lot of attention? And the commodity of influence has been traded for the commodity of attention. Let me say that again. I believe the commodity of true influence has been traded for the commodity of attention. Now, if you listen to somebody like Grant Cardone, he says it. I can't argue with him. He has the billions. I don't have the billions. But he says, I've got to be in front of you 24-7. I've got to be in your space, in your, in your head, rent-free. I've got to be a name that's on the tip of your tongue in order for you to know that I exist, in order for you to know that I am doing what I'm doing in business. If I'm on the tip of your tongue, in the back of your mind, always in your eyeballs, always on your feet, always in every form of social media and media that you can possibly consume, then I have your attention. If I have your attention, then I can influence you. And if I can influence you, then I can find out who's got my money. That's not a bad progression of thoughtful marketing. But is it influence? See, the stories that we tell, they tend to hang on with people. They recall the things that we've said. And as I've said before, there are three levels of winning with our stories. The first level is when somebody says, I really like your story, it moved me. The second is when somebody comes and tells you, my story is just like your story, I need to tell you my story. And the third is when they hear your story and they go do something about it. They hear the solution that you've offered and they realize I need to do that same thing. I need to take that same action. I, I've got to take action on this on this story. I, I didn't know what I know now. And if they go out and they tell somebody else the story and that same person they tell the story to takes the same action that you inspired the first person to take, now your, your story and your action are going viral. That means your story and your action have greater influence than you alone. And if your story gets repeated three, four, or five different times by three or four or five different people, and all of them relate your story in such a way that others take action, now your cause has gone viral because of your story. But you know what kind of stories don't have that kind of impact? Do you know what kind of stories don't have influence and therefore they don't make an impact and therefore they don't become viral sensations and therefore their transformation that's offered in the call to action goes nowhere? Bad stories. Stories that are boring, acrimonious, diminishing. Yeah, that was, that was a really quick acrostic of a bad story. A boring story, an acrimonious story, a diminishing story. A story that, that demeans other people, that makes them feel small because it's designed to make you feel big. If you've ever watched, and there's tons of them, the quote-unquote influencers on social media love to make videos like uh, Gold Digger, Caught in the Act. And so they stage this attractive young person caught up in this web of deceit as they pretend to ignore the star of the video, three minute video, probably took more investment to rent the Lamborghini to make the video than the longevity of the value of the video in the end. But it's, it's purveying a certain thought process. And maybe the first one or two of them that looked very real, uh, they, were, they were making a profound statement. They were, they were leading the charge of exposing the gold diggers, the ones who really aren't interested in a guy because of his, and maybe not even his looks or his talent or his skills or his personhood. They, they're only concerned about his car. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, it's a, it's a rare female phenomenon to be more interested in a car than the personality of the guy they're considered going out with. Uh, that's a male's fantasy that by having just the right car, he can get the right girl. So the storyline and the plot are a disaster already. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying it's probably more fiction in the mind of the man, more fantasy in the mind of the man that by having the right car, he's going to get the right girl than it is common that a girl would be more fascinated with the quality of the car or the brand of the car 
than the guy that she's going out with. Just do your own research and you probably will find that that's true. But we can film these and get all the attention in the world and we can get hundreds of thousands of views and, and we can get people to watch them and rewind them. And sometimes it's only because the girl in said video is scantily clad. And so really what you're selling is eyeballs for sex. Because we know it's guys that watch these videos and less likely girls because it's not in their psychology. That's not the way they operate. So it's pretty fascinating. Now, the next one that's really fascinating is that that series of videos of there's a really fancy car and everybody's gathered around and taking pictures. And so somebody comes out and says, wow, cool car. How did you get it? What kind of motors in it? Blah, 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 blah. And really what they're doing is exposing the fraud of the people who are gathered around the fancy car. And it turns out that the person shooting the video, it's really their car. What's really even more ironic is that <clears throat> oftentimes, oftentimes these videos aren't even shot POV. It's not like, look, I'm coming to get my car and all these people are gathered around it because I have such a cool car. No, it's they've already got a film crew shooting from multiple angles as these odd people are just taking pictures with a random car. See, that these are the types of stories that show up in your social media feed that get the acclaim, the attention, the awareness, the, the notice, and get someone the label of, Influencer, let me ask you this question. If you watched a series of those stories or cats and cucumbers or people burying themselves in the sand or guys asking straight up lewd questions of absolute strangers or the guy who thinks it's hilarious to pass gas as he walks through a crowd or the guy who jumps out of the potted plant uh, corner and he's actually a live guy dressed like a shrub. Uh, back to Freaky the Snowman, right? Do they get attention? Yes. Are they garnering garnering the, the views and the clicks and the virality and being shared? Yes. Are they influencers? Well, by the definition of social media and today's standards, yes. And you might even, in the same way that I'm talking about, you might tell somebody about the video that you saw and what it meant to you. But did it bring any transformation to your life? Is it something you would consider even with all of the people who've seen it and watched it and shared it, would you, would you consider it leadership? Has it made a change in you for the positive? And if the answer is no, then maybe it's just wasted time, talent, treasure, and attention, and it's not really influence. But see, those sticky stories, those relationship stories, those stories that, that get at your heart, that, that you hear about someone doing something good for others, those are the kind of stories that lay travel. Those are the kind of stories that, that cause you to stop and think again. Those are the kind of stories that cause you to change your behavior. There's a story that my friend told me about himself one day on his way to the hunting cabin. Stopped in a grocery store. My friend's well over six foot tall. He's a big guy. Pretty sizable guy. Very old country kind of guy. And as he's walking back to his parking lot, he sees this young teenage boy just berating his mother. I mean, disrespectful, rude, loud, hateful. I mean, just horrible. And so my friend steps into the conversation and very passionately but quietly has a conversation with the young man. Physically, could be a little bit intimidating, but his words were passionate. His words were direct. His words were, well, what a father should say to his son when he's acting like that. Probably the same kind of conversation I've had with my boys at various times. The young man and his mother agree to let the young man go on a camping trip with 25 other young men. And they all go out in the woods and they're learning to use archery and they're learning to use knives and they're learning what it's like to be out in nature. And at one point, the commission from the leaders of the camp is out there in the woods somewhere God is hiding. Go find him. Come back and tell us when you do. And they all go off wandering in the woods. Well, after the process of this camp, a few days later, the young man has some epiphanies, some revelations, some new experiences. They get charged by a live hog, scares him to death. He fires his bow and arrow and doesn't kill it. Mike picks up the gun and drops the hog and they get to slaughter it and have a nice conversation about what it means to miss the mark. 
And the young man comes home and lo and behold, he's a different person. In fact, at the next year's annual banquet for this particular organization, that mom stood up and said, I don't know exactly what you did, but I sent away an angry young man and I got back a great man. That's the kind of story that goes viral. That particular story, that woman has told that story for over a decade now. Now, I haven't seen or heard from her in a while because I'm not tied to that organization anymore. But the impact that it had on her son in that one weekend changed his life. And her story being told from the fundraiser, through the videos, in the magazine, in the postcards that were sent out to potential donors, that story influenced thousands, maybe not hundreds of thousands, maybe not 20 million, maybe not Kardashian or Rogan level of influence, maybe not even a gold digger video level of influence, but the people that it did influence, they helped. They helped the organization. That, that organization is going on three decades old now, still doing the same kind of work, giving young men a chance to get out of the city and out in the woods and find God, find themselves, find passion, find reality, find what it means to treat people with dignity and honor. That's a powerful and important thing. That's influence. And I'll promise you, some of those young men went away boys and they came back men. They went away with no story in their life besides what they've lived through already on the streets or in a, in a bad relationship with their parents or maybe even a bad experience in foster home. And they came back with an identity that they could have never perceived before that trip. Those are the kind of stories that they will be telling the rest of their life. The kind of stories they will tell their kids. Many of them, like veterans who have come back and gone to the Oak, uh, Winding Oaks, Missing Oaks, something, uh, kind of retreat center for veterans struggling with PTS. They come back and say, I will never not go there. I saw a news report just last night of a veteran who had come back from war after many tours, after many combat trips after being shot at many times, came back from war altogether, all in one piece. But after several months, collapsed one day with an aortic valve problem that they didn't realize was untreated PTSD. It, it was the war coming home inside his mind and emotions. Stories that he hadn't told anybody were eating him up from the inside. And he collapsed and nearly died. And the only way to save his life was to amputate one leg and replace veins near his heart with veins from his leg. So now he's an amputee as a result of the stories inside him that came back from the war zone. But the cool part of that story was when they were talking about all the things that had been done to help him get his life back together. He's been given a new house. That's why he was on, on the news story. But it also talked about another organization that helped him get his life right, that helped him get back in physical condition, that helped him get his story straight on the inside. And that's an organization called the Adaptive Training Foundation. Well, one of my best friends, one of my mentors is on the board of that organization. And after retiring from corporate America, he has poured his heart and his life into helping these men who are coming back from war, those that are struggling with having lost limbs. And the stories that he hears from these guys who've come back from combat and gals, the ones who have lost limbs in car accidents or to drunk drivers, the stories would tear your heart out. Many of them have said, I'm done. I quit. I give up on life. If I can't have my full body, I can't have a full life. And I can't have a full life. I don't want to live one at all. That's how they walk in the door. And after nine weeks of intense physical training and intense psychological conversation, they walk out with a new leash on life, a whole new perspective. They tell others, you need to be a part of this. They drag people, some of them unwillingly, into the Adaptive Training Foundation. They give them a barbell. I've, I've watched men, no joke, no exaggeration, I have watched men with no legs drive a sled across the floor while they're building their core and their abs because they know they're going to be sitting in a wheelchair or moving themselves around without one, and they have nothing but their upper body strength and their core strength to live on. 
I've watched them drag those chairs, drag their wheelchairs, pull themselves up while attached to a wheelchair because they have no legs at all. I've watched them with one arm missing, take off their robot arm and walk up the, work up the other arm the best way that they can. I've watched them struggling with MS, get out there on that gym floor and work their tails off. I took over 1,500 pictures. I took a film crew there to see what's going on at Adaptive Training Foundation. Those, my friend, are stories that will change your life. Those are stories that will cause you to back up and go, have I not been grateful for everything that I have and everyone that I am? When you hear the stories of others, the tragic stories of others, the true stories of others, not the made-up gold digger videos, oh, they get plenty of attention. That, my friends, is not influence. Influence is when you hear the story of someone else and you think, I'm glad I didn't have to go through that, but I'm inspired to do something better in my life. That's when transformation comes. And when you repeat that story to somebody else, that's when virality happens. And if you want to be a leader who has influence, tell better stories better. Select stories that have that longevity, that retelling passion that others want to hear and then repeat Attach those stories to a call to action that can genuinely transform lives. And when people repeat your story, they will repeat the action. And when they repeat the action, they will see the transformation. And when they see the transformation, they will repeat the transformation. And now you have done the four M's, according to John Maxwell and Brandon Dawson. Model, mimic, master, multiply. And your story has greater legs than you. It has greater longevity than you. It has a legacy. When you tell better stories better, your leadership becomes a legacy because those stories will never be forgotten. They will be retold for ages. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast, where Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. Lauren is a master teacher on storytelling, and I learned so much. Um, I'm really going to have to sit down and go back through everything, and I think I might have to have some more coffees with Lauren, but uh, it was totally worth my time, and I really highly recommend it if you're looking to grow your ministry, grow your business, uh, grow your career. Uh, Lauren will serve you well.